Welcome to another episode of Tales from the Tables with your host, Rob Radley. John Charles Ciccarelli. James Burroughs. And Damian Hallwood. Yes, hello and welcome to episode 45 of Tales from the Tables. Ooh, 45. 45. Creeping and, up on that 52 number. Yep, yep. I think um, I think we have, we're going to have to put our hands together um, and give a, a big round of applause to JC, who's not made it to today's um, podcast, but he has been in every single podcast episode up until this point. So he's, he's, he's broken the record, as far as we're concerned. 45 <laughs> episodes. Everyone, JC, a big round of applause. JC, yeah, JC. Well done, JC. It cool. feels like the breaking of the Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania. It feels like <laughs> it's not quite right, but I understand why he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. How many returns did the Undertaker have in WWE's? Like, I, 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 I go through this like bizarre obsession where I, I will literally like I love watching um, when wrestlers return, when old wrestlers return to WWE, yeah, and they're like, yeah. and they're like, then the music plays, and then they all come out, and they're like, it's like it's like a real hero, hero returns type of thing, and I love that. But Undertaker's like, his is the best because obviously the lights go down, it's like bong, and it's just like yeah, yeah. Like, every, like the dudes on the stage shitting themselves, it's just like so funny, love it. Love not, watch, not watch wrestling in so long, but I think that's just because I don't have the proper TV subscription anymore to to watch it. But yeah, as a kid, I used to be really into it. I had this floating wrestling arena that used to go in the bath. Um, <laughs> that was great. I had like a little trap door in the middle. It was fucking excellent. <laughs> I just could not get enough of it. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's as pretty toys cool. go, who's your, who's your favorite wrestler? Oh, I did quite like uh, Rey Mysterio. I think that was he was oh, up there, yeah. and Triple that's H as well. Awesome. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Triple H. This is all a bit. This is during the Attitude Era, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was, I was um, Hulkamania and Ultimate Warrior and oh, Macho Man Randy Savage. Did. Yeah, my, that my was that was me basically. 90, 92, <laughs> 91, 91 to ninety six was my wrestling like obsession years. Oh, not to, not to, not to make you feel bad, Rob, but I was born in ninety three, so I was. Uh... <laughs> Not, what, in- not watching wrestling in 92. Holy <laughs> friggin' shit. Yeah. Right. Well, apologies. <laughs> I was 13 in 93. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, I was in like, I was in like secondary school, you know. <laughs> Snogging Crazy. girls in the woods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could be your dad, James. Well, no. Uh, being... Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean... <laughs> definitely couldn't have been your dad. But no. No. Give me maybe a year or so, but yeah, no. Not quite. <laughs> anyway, anyway, moving on. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. How have we? How have we all been? I've not. Obviously, I've not been on the podcast in a couple of weeks. I've had my work's been been crazy. So um, yeah. But Good I am. Crazy. What was that, Rob? <laughs> Good crazy. Well, busy at least, which is, I suppose, something. Um, but in the meantime, I have also been working on my very special D and D room, um, yeah. and I have not got quite as much done last weekend as I wanted. As it turned out, that the sheer amount of spray adhesive I needed to use to yep. attach a cloud covering to the ceiling of the room was insane, and probably enough that my lungs are now sort of have a layer of sticky glue covering yeah. them having in far too much um but no there so that part that part a majority of the ceiling is finished i just need to staple it all to my ceiling now but that requires the help of multiple people because it's heavy uh, it's heavy but it, it's just awkward as well um, and yeah, essentially yeah. i've stuck all this poly filler um like fluff for like inside of teddies to a giant king size sheet which covers yep. the majority of the of the ceiling which looks incredible. I've put the LED lights, they're all attached to the ceiling already, but I've tested it on the ground with the LED lights underneath it to see what the effects look like. And it looks sick. Uh, <laughs> it really does look like lightning coming through like cloud cover oh, in, a, in, a, in a dark room. So, You're going to do a video, James, and post it on the Discord when it's, when it's done. Oh, I have been videoing the process. Uh, oh. Not all of it, but in stages. So I've done little videos. So yeah, when it's all done, I can release a series of videos showing the 
<laughs> if you want, I can make I can make you um I can make you like a little video if you like. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll get them all sent to you. We could do it all together for you. Make it, yeah. make it cool. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty sick. And I've spent that's, that's yeah. great. How much how much how much money have you spent? I think I've spent probably a hundred and fifty on all the stuff to do it. And a lot of that is the glue, because that is expensive. Weirdly, the sheets aren't that expensive. The polyfill I've got so much extra polyfill. So if anyone wants like two kilograms of uh, teddy bear fluff, hit me up. Um, (laughs) Because I bought four kilograms thinking that probably will, that might not even be enough and I'll just buy some more. No, no, way too much. Um, But I also bought um, like stick on um, brick panels for the walls. Oh yeah. They need to be be painted because I ordered gray and they turned up silver. But so I had to pay for paint as well um but the tiles themselves i think there was like it's like 40 meters of tiles um these big like uh, half a meter by half a meter square tiles uh and they were like on amazon four pound for 10 square tiles so i think i spent like 25 quid on those and that will pretty much do most of the room it's just the the painstaking effort to like paint them and dry brush them so they look like actual medieval brick i bought I bought quite a lot of stuff on Timu that is unusable. So that is my, my recommendation. If you're thinking of doing some sort of DIY project, you're like, oh, I'll get some little accents from Timu. They won't look like the pictures. They will be terrible. And despite the fact you may have only spent £20, they will still not be worth it. <laughs> wow. wow. I bought a lot. I bought, I bought, what I was planning to do is like get some like hanging vines and stuff for some corners of the room to make it sort of look like this overgrown like tavern like fairy like into the into the forest to make like a fake window um but what was actually delivered uh but was essentially some green plastic string with a few leaves a few plastic shod- shoddy looking leaves attached to it uh, so, so that idea has been thrown out uh until yeah, i can yeah. source some better materials um, I, I, I had that problem with my my um farmer's market stand i've ordered a load of like fantasy stuff and it just like like the, the leaves like was just like crap and i tried to get like some like ground like some ground like like uh, fake grass yeah and I, I ordered it, it was like oh great and it literally arrived it was like like a tiny like a foot mm. by a foot <laughs> yeah. like, what the hell is this yeah that's uh, uh... i'll tell you what you, can use, what you can use your teddy bear um insert his foamy stuff for if you mm-hmm. if you um get yourself some of those you know those little like uh, tea lights uh that candles yes that yeah they sell electric ones where you just put like a little battery in the back of it. Mm-hmm. Put that inside one of inside a clump of that smoke, or well, yeah. you said just giving it away. That's basically what you're going to create is smoke. So you yeah. put that onto the battlefield, onto mm-hmm. your like gaming table or wherever it is, and it just looks like a great big explosion that's gone off. Oh, I see that's pretty cool. cool. Especially I... on Warhammer, Warhammer tables, that looks amazing. It does. Yeah, <laughs> my my brother's trying to get me back into Warhammer okay. as well. <laughs> uh. I do you know what I I love it so much. I know I said in the chat, like you know, I really fucking annoys me the fact that they've done so many editions. That does annoy me because there's only so much space on my shelf for books and things, and then like and like to have that like rule book come out when I've when the the other rule book is is so nice and now it's no longer needed or you're never going to use it again. It's like it's just such a shame. Yeah, it is. It is annoying. I still got all my old seventh edition codexes and and the rule book from back then. Yeah, I think I've got the terrain from the starter set, the Macrage starter set with the um, Ultramarines and the Tyranids. Oh yeah, nice. So <laughs> I think if me and my brother do end up playing, it'll be using those old old rule sets. But oh, okay, yeah. well that's that's fair enough because I because I play historic magic. I don't oh. I don't subscribe to the new magic decks where they come out every every like couple of freaking weeks. Like I don't, I don't, and they, then they then they make everything everything illegal to play. Like I don't do any of that shit. I just I just have my own decks that I build from as many cards from all the cards that have ever been ever been released. I make like one or two really fucking amazing decks, and those are my decks. And then I play against other guys who are my friends who are doing exactly the same thing. And that's yeah. like that's how we have fun with magic. You know, that's, that seems like the best way to do it. Yeah. If you can do it without spending an insane amount of money and just use what you've already got, um, oh, I'll, spend, I'll spend an insane amount of money. But like, well, <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah. But, it's, but it's but it's on my terms. Yeah, <laughs> it's not on their terms, <laughs> and that's the key. If you're going to bankrupt yourself, you do it on your terms. Exactly. What um what army would you pick? Uh, probably probably Tyrants again. Uh, Tyrants. I, I just love. I really like Alien. 
the they horde. Look so much like the alien and the horde. But yeah, the that's the issue with it though is that you end up having to paint and build so many more yeah. minis. Yeah. With the space marines, you you get a squad and it's like five troopers. You get a squad of tyrannids, it's like sixteen. And they're a similar size. <laughs> I think the I'm, a I'm, a, I'm a Tyranid player. I have been for a long time. Yeah. And I've got the... When they, they just recently, for 10th edition, redid all the... Or a lot of the models for Tyranids mm. really nicely too. And I've got a whole box of them all primed up and built, ready to paint. And just haven't had the time to paint them. Um, but the thing that's always bugged me about Tyranids is you set your horde. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why you play Tyranids. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's why you play Tyranids, right? Is to, to do a horde. Yeah. But... Yeah. Generally, that's not how the army is best played. Most of the time, mm. you just put four or five big monsters on the battlefield, and that mm. tends to be the better list. And yeah. I don't like that because I, I much prefer the idea of a, a you know, Clendathu attack from Starship Troopers. That, that's yeah. the fantasy yeah. for the It's absolutely swarming a base with yeah. loads and loads of Hormigants or Termigants, and mm. that's just. I, I haven't yeah. really played them in tenth, and I think it's got a little better. But still, the lists I see, the competitive lists are always, you know, oh, three Khan right. effectors and a Hive Tyrant. And it's just like, where's all the bugs? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, ridiculous. it's ridiculous. It's like it's like the power the power gaming in Warhammer is just like so stupid. It's like when you play against Space Marines and they're all and you could play against an army, they're all on bikes. And you're like, really, <laughs> you really turn up a load of guys on bikes, like because 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 you know that the terrain we're fighting on is flat. Like if you didn't know it was flat. And it was like like buildings and like it was built up area and it was difficult terrain to pass over. You would never have turned up on bikes. But because <laughs> you because you, Mr. Player Man, knows that, you then decide to come with like this ridiculous army that is tailored in a meta in a meta like way that is just shit. Like I, I, I prefer to have like a cinematic game. Like and I don't care if I lose. I, yeah, just, yeah. I just want it to be epic. You know, I, I I do agree with you actually, yeah. I yeah. like I had a couple of different Warhammer tables growing up that my uh, I was lucky enough for my, my parents to build for me. And then also when they released, they started, uh, Games Workshop started releasing the buildings, like the 40k like building kits. They were excellent. We had um, a ton of those that we built and painted uh, as well. But they really clogged up the board. We, Me and my brother just like um, would put probably far too many uh, on there to really like jam up sight lines and you could like get really close, close in with it without... Um, like worrying too much about getting obliterated from across the board yeah so, yeah it's much more cinematic um and also a bit more strategic which is it's fun rather than relying on like a meta list i yeah i i i, I get the playing warhammer in, in tournaments and sort of having to to play meta lists if you're going to do that I, i'm sure there would be a way you could run a tournament where it didn't you didn't have to do that maybe by changing um, yeah the t terrains and, and other things like that so yeah you could take a bikes game and you and you could play maybe one game in a big open field and it would be very effective and then you put them in a horrible like uh close in environment and they're useless yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah, that's, that's the the thing conquest well. rules now for that sort of narrative game where you have territory mm. and you, you sort of slowly take mm. over each other's territory which is great in a home like you say in a home game where you can control how meta the games get um i think the one thing for 40k that still holds them in such high regard despite having a bit of a, a creep on too many editions is their miniatures are still and increasingly oh, the best. Still incredible yeah in a world where 3d print you know i've got a 3d printer i've printed some really beautiful models i've got a load in a a, a wish list <laughs> to eventually get hold of and print but still i look at Games Workshop's miniatures on both sides, 40k and Sigma, and what will soon be Old World again. And I just think, man, they, they're just so good. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're on That's such the a thing. high That's, level. It's, and it's great that they are because, because obviously, because of the fact that people have got 3D printers. Like, I remember when, they, when 3D printers first came out, my mate Mark was like, oh, yeah, great. I'll be able to 3D print like Warhammer stuff. And oh, that'd be amazing. And I was just like, I always thought to myself, well, what Warhammer have to do is just make sure their game is so fucking high. That they are literally untouchable, and I yeah. think they are untouchable. I think if you look at their miniatures, like you say, like the detail is insane. Yeah, so good. They've got so good with posing. You know, digitally sculpting things yeah. now, mm. it, it means that they can do things with miniatures that historically they've never been able to do. You know, have them floating up on, uh, you know, false hovering using cloaks and scenery and uh, incredible, yeah. you know, tentacles and and flowing robes and. 
just so much detail and much thinner pieces with a, you know still quite a sturdy plastic yeah really 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 incredible stuff and great yeah, for, awesome. still great for warhammer you know if you use a lot of the sigma stuff for warhammer miniatures i know there's a few gms in the in the rolled out chat that have posted pictures of warhammer miniatures for their D D games mm. um, and they look great they really do yeah. I'd like to make like a diorama, like a is it? Is that, have I pronounced that right? Diorama. 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 Yeah, diorama. Cause have you seen the one with the, the space, the space marine at the top of the mountain, and he's shooting the nids? Yeah. He's got like, <laughs> like all these dead space marines around him, and he's like, he's just like got his one what's it, uh, plasma pistol, and he's just like, <laughs> like getting them. It just looks so sick. I've got like, to say that, that is a cinematic thing is just so cool. That is um, something that the stores are very, uh, very good at. Um, yeah. At, yeah, um, putting on the diorama. I've seen the one from uh, the Manchester Games Workshop store. Crazy. Like it is, it's like a full on invasion of like tyrannies of stuff in the sky. It's nuts. Uh, so yeah, I do, I do really like seeing those. And yeah, it'd be cool to, to have one of those uh, like yeah. as well. Finding the space for it is the issue. Yeah. yeah apparently, right. apparently, mm-hmm. apparently, you had an office, Rob, that you could just put wherever you wanted in. And... <laughs> well, you, say, you say all of that, but I'm literally like run out of space in here now. And, yeah. Like, it's mental. It's like today, well, yesterday, actually, Charlotte's parents were down, well, her dad was down, and he was saying to me, like, why don't you just like move into your garage? You've got plenty of space in your garage. And I was like, I was like, uh, I can't really do that, Steve, because then Charlotte will see all this shit that I've bought that she doesn't realize <laughs> it's her. Like, like mm-hmm. uh, you know, three foot jet. And <laughs> like yeah. load of a load of Gundam, and like uh, now now a now a ham radio that I've used like once. <laughs> you know, it's like just I just keep buying shit for myself because I just sit here and I get bored and I'm like right, what should I what should I do now? What should I do? Now? Oh, I know I'll just uh, build build like a build a Gundam or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad it's not just me who's like ah oh, yeah to see something online. It's like yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to have a go at that. Use it once, yeah. never again. Just. <laughs> bad for that man like yeah so just hyper focus on something for a bit yeah i've got a real problem with it it's why it's why i look at lego and i'm like i'm like i like lego a lot Mm. but the price tag it it's it's so unrealistic to the experience of what you're getting like for example gundam you can buy you can buy like a 50 quid kit of gundam it will take you three days to build and looks incredible on your shelf like it's yeah. amazing a 50 quid lego set will take you half an hour to build and it'll be about that big yeah you know what i mean it's like it's like mm. and yeah so lego's a bit like yeah it was with gundam it's like yeah it's like so <laughs> cool I mean, look look at them they're just so fucking awesome yeah i might i might, might build another one actually <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, oh anyway, D and D. Hooray. Yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> got got tangented by other hobbies, which it very true to life. Um <laughs> I think it's safe to say that most people that play D and D are probably also dabbling in other things like Warhammer and yeah. everything else. Gundam, yeah, I would I would imagine. But, um talking about Lego actually, have you guys been collecting the minifigures? I have got not. A few. No? I've got three yeah. at the moment. Twelve in total, isn't there? I think so. yeah, and we've got th- we've yeah. got three of them here because of some of our friends in our home game brought a load of blind boxes and just handed them out to everybody and just oh, nice. we all that's opened nice. them and swapped out any that we had doubles and so yeah, oh, it was that's pretty lovely. cool. That's lovely. I need to figure out where to get them. You can't get one on Amazon. Well, you can get one on Amazon. But they're like they're like three times the price. Sounds like yeah. Amazon. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so daft. I have to have a look around because if it was a toy shop in my local high street, but it's closed down, which is really annoying. Who was it? Them for the raffle for Rolex Fest next next week. Oh yes, uh, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Anna, uh, one, another one of our Roll Dark GMs, who was saying that there's like a QR code you can scan on the packets if you do see them in person that will tell you what's in. Tells you what's inside the box, yeah. so you don't need to buy it blindly. You can find out. And I had no idea about that, so I thought I'd share it on the podcast because people deserve to know. You yeah, don't have to buy the blind. <laughs> there's a Lego app, app. yeah. If you scan it, it tells you what's inside the box. That's mm. that's really good that they that they've done that. But I would like that for the D and D box minis that are blind because that is a nightmare. Even if you are buying like a spe- like a set specific to a setting, um, or like a like a source book, you can still end up with way too many duplicates or not getting like the, <laughs> the one thing that you want. A barrel and a couple of dogs. Yeah, like I've got the same. <laughs> More <laughs> goblins. I don't need any more goblins. I'm drowning in them. 
I've always hated the blind box model. I, I, I never yeah. subscribe to it. I, I never get them because it just I really don't like well. that. Really I, bad no, I, I get I get it, but for mm. me I just I don't I, I don't deal with the frustration. I, I much prefer to look at my box, what I'm getting, know what I'm spending my money on, and make the decision. Because I'm like you guys. I, I mean, thank goodness for my wife, because if I didn't have my wife, my hobby trajectory would be hyper focus, spend too much money, hyper focus, spend too much money, hyper focus, spend too much money, and I'd be destitute. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much destitute at the minute. So yeah, so. <laughs> Thank so, yes. I'm like, oh, I look at my bank account. Yeah, all right, I'll just wait till payday to look at my bank account. Yeah, wait till payday. I still get away with some of it. You know, I did, I did get a 3D printer and you know D and D. I've had to, I've had to put my Tyranids in a box and just leave them there because I just don't have time to paint them. Yeah, um, maybe one day. But yeah, I, I would be so bad. So I can't. The blind model would be dangerous for me, and I just don't let myself. I don't let yeah. myself do it. Mm. Was <laughs> it that? How does EA try to justify it? Surprise mechanics, they're loot boxes. It's a loot box, but in phys like a physical loot box, and I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Just tell yeah. me what I'm buying. Just You can have the boxes be the same price. They'll have the same stuff in. I suppose they'll lose money because people will, will buy less because they'll just be able to buy what they want. They're like, yeah. Well, apart from Rodok Randoms, right? We love that, uh, that element. Rodok Randoms That's is great. That that's yeah. fine because they're dice uh, and they're not you're not, the you're not way, going right? into it yeah, the same way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, you know that is different dice. that's a that's a cosmetic difference I, it's not like i'm getting a dice set with like without a d20 in yeah. it randomly uh, that yeah, would be that would be different than again like. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i wanted it. dice and i got and i got oh i got a box full of throat lozenges that's not what i was after <laughs> Could tell I panicked and just looked around my room for the first thing that was <laughs> visible there. <laughs> uh, yes, well, so any uh, news, Damien, this week? Yes, indeed. Yeah, a couple of bits to go through. A couple of non DD bits, uh, a couple of DD bits, and that's about it. The big thing being this week, uh, I mentioned it last week, that early October that we are now deep into is the time when they're going to start talking about. The Dungeon Master's Guide and start slowly drip feeding information about what's inside. Um, but before we get to that, just a couple of really quick bits. Um, this this made me smile. Uh, the term dungeon crawler has made it into uh, the English dictionary, thanks to Miriam Webster. Um, wow. Yeah. The actual term dungeon crawler, the, the description of it that they give seems to be focused on video games. Um, but yes, the term dungeon crawler has become a a dictionary term, which I think is fun. Uh, yeah, uh, what, like dungeon crawler, one word? Dungeon hyphen crawler, yeah. Hyphen crawler. Wow. Oh, no, no, no hyphen. No, just dungeon crawler. One word? Two. Two words, right. Wow. I was going to say, that's... Yeah. Bonkers. They've added 200 new words and phrases, and that is that is one of them, is dungeon wow. crawler. Wow. So. <laughs> 200 words and phrases. Crikey. It, it, yeah. I don't know the full list, but um, strange modernisms on there that uh, that I just don't get. <laughs> but dungeon crawler, that's cool. Shade. On there. shade. I imagine shade's probably on there. And someone gives probably. you shade. That could be on there. Couldn't Surely it? shade's already in there. They might have updated the definition, but shade's definitely. How long have you been using shade? That's a word. Using shade for well, I don't know. Since the the sun and and things that block the sun existed, oh, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Very, very good, very good. I mean, as in, like, obviously, you know what I mean when you give someone. I shade, know what you mean. Yeah, when yeah. You give yeah. The shade, like, hmm. basically, like what like, I just did. Exactly, dirty look, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if this is. I don't know how much this is. This feels like it might appeal to you, Rob, with your your Gundam, uh, love. It's not Gundam. Yeah, right, it's, it's a step closer, I think. Ooh. We're getting a Voltron RPG. Voltron. Voltron. Uh oh. Yeah, from Catalyst Game Labs, best known for Shadow Run and BattleTech, which makes sense. Uh, Voltron tabletop role playing game. There's not much detail yet, uh, but it will be coming, as most of these new TTRPGs, to Kickstarter at some point. Oh, yeah. It's on there now. Well, it's all right. It's been, it's been. It's got the landing page, yeah. Yeah, there's a landing page there. Cool. I'm trying to. Rack my brains what Voltron is. is it, I'm guessing it's anime, is it? It's, oh, a, yeah. it's, it's a big, a, yeah, it's a mech. 
Um, I don't know it brilliantly, but I know it's a I know it's a, a mech. Uh, yeah, so all the parts come together to form like all the different robots joined together yeah. to make Voltron. Yeah, sort of like yeah. I mean, very. Um, I, I think it was the original, but mm, don't hold me to that. But I know Power Rangers did something similar where their mechs combined to make a big mega Zords. Sword. Yeah, yeah. That so that could sword. be a fun, a, con- a fun system. I mean, more mech systems is always, uh, always good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love a good mech. Isn't it? It's, cool. it's, it's, it's an interesting idea being role playing as a mech. Yeah, I'm interested to see how that works because I'm a big, I'm a big kaiju fan. I love Godzilla, all eras of Godzilla uh, and mm. other, you know, Godzilla adjacent monsters and and decent mm. kaiju films. So mm. I've always thought a kaiju role playing game would be fun, but how it would work, I don't know because obviously you've got the sort of human element, which is much easier to sort of get yourself into and get you in, into the mindset of being people surrounded by giant monsters, but then sort of what you want from a kaiju story is let them fight. <laughs> you want yeah. to see big monsters scrapping. So I don't it's know how it would work. Yeah. Maybe you could play both sides of that coin somehow. But uh, yeah. You do it like a Pacific Rim pilot. You play yeah. you play as a pilot, don't you? And then you maybe there's some sort of investigative work you do around how or where the kaijus are appearing. And then you do some mech fighting in the, in the suits and you have like a rule set for both halves of the of the game maybe it'd be better for maybe it'd be better as a like a one-shot sort of system rather than a long form campaign but i imagine you could make it work but yeah you are right if you're playing a game with mech suits and kaiju you you want to be fighting for a good amount of time (laughs) it it fascinates me why why the japanese are so obsessed with with kaiju and and mech like it's like giant like giants effectively but like but not just not just mechs, also like giant monsters as well. It's like it's like it's, it seems to be this obsession with things that I are mean. Massive. In fifty four, Godzilla, when Godzilla first appeared uh, mm. on cinema screens, it was an allegory for the war nuclear. and for uh, oh, the atomic, nuclear, atomic bombs. nuclear bombs, and it oh, was wow. it was it's quite Godzilla it was. Quite... It... I'm oh, sorry, Damien. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. I was going to say Godzilla was a, a force of nature. It was something completely unstoppable. Right. Something, uh, and not only that, something that had been triggered by human meddling, um, and it, you know, that sort of deep allegory of of using a yeah. weapon of such incredible power, and whether we should, and which of course we shouldn't, um, and yeah, it was. I, I think from there, it went more in the direction of hang on a minute this is you know this is really deep and 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 meaningful and allegorical but also how friggin cool is that giant monster stomping on buildings <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. well, it's, it's it is very interesting that you sort of um what people took by like different cultures took from the atomic bomb so yeah japan sort of went the godzilla monster this unstoppable destructive force and then the uh, like america you ended up with lots of superheroes suddenly getting powers from radioactive yes materials and it being this great power giving uh thing that is quite interesting to see that like clearly people's understanding and takeaways from nuclear power and uh, and stuff was wild obviously wildly different and like it did represent itself in in media in that in that kind of way it is interesting isn't it it's um I remember the first game I absolutely loved when I was a kid on my Atari twenty six hundred. It was uh, <laughs> with Rampage. Do you guys ever remember? Yeah, Rampage? yeah. yeah. Like, there's a film of it recently with uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I'm sure, it's absolute garbage. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We're one hundred percent. It's crap. But uh, are there any Godzilla games where you can play Godzilla and go through a yeah. city and just yeah. destroy the freaking city? Yeah, they're, yes. they're mostly focused on um, battling other monsters. Uh, it, right, does, yeah, it does involve other than like destroying human humanity yeah, and yeah. civilization. You are wading yeah. through. I did. I did. There's one I've got on my PlayStation that I, I bought. That's just. It's very clunky to control, but it, right. it's very nostalgic to see all the different monsters and play as them. Um, not the most dynamic game, but it's still pretty fun to stomp around and. Oh yeah. Breathe atomic breath on other monsters and stuff. The best one. <laughs> And I again, I just desperately hope that we get not just a remaster. I think a, a full sort of full remake treatment would be great. Is a game called War of the Monsters, which I played on PlayStation Two, 
and War of the Monsters. That involved sort of slightly smaller monsters than than Godzilla, more sort of King Kong sized monsters stomping around various locations, throwing uh, satellite towers at each other and <laughs> explosive oil trucks, and it was it. Oh, it looks pretty good. It was really fun. It was a really fun game to play. Uh, very sort of that atomic age yeah. feeling, you know, UFOs oh. coming down and the toxic sludge from the UFOs creating all these massive kaiju from praying mantis and, and reptiles and giant apes and then the humans building robots to combat them and yeah, it was really, a really nostalgic sort of pulp sci-fi inspired game and I really wish that we'd get a, a, an updated version of it because it's still fun to play now. That's very cool. Yeah, it looks it looks it looks pretty sick. Um, so you play you play you can play any not just a robot you can play different monsters and things. Yeah, you and... can play all of the monsters and you could unlock a few of them yeah. as well. Like there's it, it was it was unlocked like a fighting game, you know, like a Tekken or a, a oh yeah Mortal Kombat where you would unlock okay. different monsters, including a dragon. They had a dragon on there. Um, nice, which I think was one of the last ones you could unlock. Yeah. Really nice. cool. I made out of stone, <laughs> yeah. Godzilla type of guy. Great big yeah. bug creature. Well, classic speaking of 1950s bugs. robot type thing. Sweet. Speaking of bugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Alien. We oh, got yeah. a little oh, yes. bit of another update on the Alien RPG. It's getting its second edition on an as yet to be Already? Uh, date. <laughs> it is. Oh. Um, and they've released some maps from the upcoming Kickstarter uh, for. Uh, Rapture Protocol, which is going to be sort of the uh, the adventure included in the Kickstarter, uh, full color this time. A lot of the a lot of the Alien RPG maps have historically looked like they come straight from the screens of the movies okay. with uh, very sort of green scale imagery, whereas these are full color maps. Very very nice, very nicely rendered. Um, nice. They say we're going to get one for Hadley's Hope to to match this style as well, which is exciting because uh, everybody loves Hadley's Hope and. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, that would yeah, be it's iconic, really cool to see. More interestingly, they've said that, and I quote, using these maps, the miniatures, and the updated rules, Alien RPG 2E can even be played as a miniature skirmish game. So, okay. Okay. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing mm. for, the t for the RPG, because... Uh, 4th edition of Dungeons & Dragons very historically was very much miniature battle-focused. And that was very, very divisive. Um, so I'm hoping they don't change the rules too much because I really like the system as it is. It, it's very tense and very fast and, and can lead to a great deal of ca catastrophe very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I don't want them to change it too much. So I'm a little nervous by that statement, but by the same token, the idea of having uh, Xenomorph miniatures, I know there are a few out there, but getting some New Xenomorph miniatures is always great. So, we'll see how that goes. Have you have you heard that FX are bringing out an Alien TV series? I have. I've been following that Ooh. relatively closely, um, yeah. even though I know I'm probably not going to enjoy it, because I haven't enjoyed anything in the Alien franchise uh. since... I I'm going to say Alien 3, because I, I do enjoy <laughs> yeah. some parts of I, it. I, I love Alien 3. I do enjoy some parts of it. Um yeah, I think it's. I think Alien Three is a very, a very underappreciated movie. I think it is too. I, and I understand why it's underappreciated. It because it killed two fan favorite characters right out of the gate. Uh, it had a lot <laughs> that of no one really saw well. coming. Yeah, yeah, and also, and also as well, it's kind of, it's kind of like, how do you make a sequel to Aliens? Like, you know, that that film was like you, you know, you have to up the like, you have to like crank it up, and they didn't crank it up. They kind of cranked it down. Yeah, and then went sideways. But yeah, yeah, they didn't crank it down enough to make it really intimate. But no, uh, yeah, so it just yeah ended up feeling a bit flat compared to Aliens. Yeah, the two, script comparatively, script, the script was absolute dog shit. Although I really, really enjoyed Charles Dance's performance in it. I thought yeah, he was yeah. great. There's some he great was great performances in the movie. Yeah, he was brilliant. He was like he like carried the whole thing for me. I think the lesson <laughs> is don't try and make a sequel to a movie that James Cameron made. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. It's pretty simple. <laughs> unless, unless you're James Cameron, unless in which case James you Cameron. sort of get away with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> people, people just people just say it was good without even going to watch mm. it. 
like there's like an Avatar film. I haven't seen that film. I'm sure it's great. But I haven't seen it. Although I didn't yeah. like the first one. I thought the first one was shit. <laughs> if you don't it was just very one, innovative. You're probably not 3D like wise, but yeah. It... What do we call this substance that you can't obtain? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. How about like the scientists? How about unobtainium? <laughs> like what a thick. <laughs> what? Yeah. I gotta say that that still does bother me. <laughs> it's a little on the nose. Try, 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 try yeah. Chinian or ch- Ching Chanian or something like that. Like no, 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 unobtainium. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's not make it sound fantastical anyway. We'll just no. I mean, maybe, maybe it is a greater narrative point to speak to the lack of imagination and ingenuity in this future version of Earth. But shame, real shame. Good yeah. lord, <laughs> come on. Unbelly <laughs> two, whatever it was. Dancing yeah. with wolves, Fern Gully. Ugh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, that's we still don't have a date on that yet for Alien, um, but it is there is a Kickstarter sort of update page if you want to get yourself yeah. notified. Um, I'm eagerly anticipating that. I I hope it doesn't disappoint because the system is very good already. If you haven't played it and you like Alien, I highly recommend. Um, yeah. Moving perfect. on to D and D. Uh, just before we get to the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's a couple of uh, Baldur's Gate 3 adjacent news stories. Uh, one of which is that the uh, cast of Baldur's Gate 3, members of the cast, uh, Neil Newborn, Devorah Wilde, Theo Solomon, Samantha Bert, are going to be attending a, uh, a live play at uh, MCM Comic Con London of D&D. Oh, nice. Presumably playing their video game counterparts. I don't think that's been confirmed, but presumably playing them. And and as yet to be announced, special guest Dungeon Master. Um, the tickets available for that. So that could be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, cool. It's an incredible cast. We all love them. Um, I have my gripes with that game, but the cast is not one of them. Um, I, I've still not got past that bloody witch. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, every now and again I turn it on, I'm just, and I'm just like, nah. It, it, for some reason, the game hasn't, it hasn't captured me. Like so many other games, like like it have done before, like like the like the Knights of the Old Republic, is the only one I can really think of that was like that. I was just like, holy shit, I'm just gonna play this motherfucker to the end. Like I loved it, but but this one for some reason just hasn't. It just hasn't got me. I don't know what it is about it. I'm probably because I can't kill the witch, but but yeah. But you know what I mean? Just it just. I am similar. I I did play it fairly extensively, but I I just didn't. Mm. I didn't love it. Um, and I think a big part of that is is the sort of hedging their bets of combat. I know a lot of people love the combat, but for me, having a maximum size party of four using pretty strict 5e rules, but then not using the rules for encounter building on the other side uh, and you know, giving monsters all uh, a plethora of new abilities, which I know I want in the game itself, <laughs> but a, a plethora <laughs> of new, very powerful abilities, many more enemies than you ever would typically face in a, a game of mm. D&D. If, if you're going to do that, don't restrict the party to the rules of the game and not restrict yeah. the combat oh. encounters to the rules of the game. And yeah. I found that a little frustrating to balance. Um, maybe I'm just not good. I, I can I can hear all the get good comments coming in already um, yeah, sure. uh, yeah basically sacrifice your life having a life so you can sit indoors yeah. and <laughs> seven eight hours a day i'm just gonna take yeah, a quick, quick yeah all i'm right, just gonna mate. take a quick sip from my um, situation and see how you handle that yeah i'm just gonna take a quick sip from my um bloodborne platinum trophy here <laughs> um just to <laughs> just so you know i'm not that bad at video games um but yeah, oh. it, it just frust- it, that was one element that frustrated me. But the story and the cast was never... I, they're all great. A great mm. cast of characters. So this would be probably a really fun watch. Um, taking place on October 27th at 11am. Um, so... Okay, cool. Would, nice. you, would you guys like to have seen um, Baldur's Gate 3 be more like Skyrim? No, I don't think it... I don't well, think it would have worked. I... And I do have a problem with some RPGs like Baldur's Gate where you can't explore as large an area and it's sort of restricted. Um, yeah. And I, what I liked, what I do like about Skyrim is you can sort of live a fairly mundane life in the game if you can and not engage in, in the main story quest and things like that, which is something you can't do in Baldur's Gate. So that is the sort of thing that you're like really 
like to and you can play a slice of life and then go and kill some like low level bandits and that'll there'll always be like stuff like that to do yeah. you can't really do that in boulders gate so even with the encounters that do sort of refresh themselves you, you will hit a, like a diminishing return on that um a lot quicker anyway I but it is see... much more narratively focused than skyrim yeah i would love to see a skyrim-esque take on D, just to be able yeah. to see that world in first person uh yeah I know it can be played in both, but primarily in first person. I think a lot of people play that game, and it, to see it that way, to you know, to enter the dungeons and see uh, the, the the cast of you know an owl there in first person in in a beautifully rendered world, I think that would be a really fun way to play in in the world of D anD D. And perhaps we may get that. Um, but if you do want to play the cast of Baldur's Gate three using the rules of Five E and uh, that those rules alone. Icon of the Realms and WizKids are releasing the cast as miniatures. So we're getting nice. the Baldur's Gate 3 miniatures cast in miniature plastic form. Uh, which nice. should be a fun, do, fun little collectible. We do like our plastic crack. Um, <laughs> yeah. All of the, the main cast that you would expect are there. Um, they look like fairly nice miniatures. Uh, we've talked fairly extensively on WizKids miniatures and they're their merits versus their their downfall, but yeah, I I, I do like seeing this cast <laughs> all together in miniature form. It would be quite nice to I I yeah some of the character designs are very cool. So like having a tiefling barbarian for for Karlak, that would be yeah it'd be quite cool because it's not a miniature you see very often outside no. of you know something that's yeah that Wizkids are producing anyway. I'm sure you, I'm sure you can find 3D printed ones going back Actually, beyond yeah. But... Um, last but definitely not least we've had a few brief glimpses into the Dungeon Master's Guide thanks to Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast themselves on their YouTube channel uh, and other social platforms they've done a, a, a sort of 45 minute long video of a sort of end to end uh, dive into the, the book and what it will contain mostly focusing on the new and some of the standouts from that are the fact that in chapters where it tells you how to make adventures it provides five short adventures as examples. So it will come with five short mini adventures. Yeah. And cool. where they talk about how to create a campaign setting, they give you a almost complete campaign setting in Greyhawk with both the city of Greyhawk and the surrounding lands as well. And maps and all of that stuff is included in both of those elements, the adventures and the campaign setting. Uh, yeah, lots that's... and lots of uh, what will be later available on the website, tracking sheets. So NPC tracking sheets, settlement tracking sheets, uh, campaign tracking sheets, lots of evergreen stuff that they think Dungeon Masters will be able to use extensively. I think that's the watchword for the whole book, really, is make it more usable. Because there's some great advice in the Dungeon Masters Guide currently, but it's not the most sort of grab it and use it at most sessions type of book, mm. really. Um, a whole chapter consolidating things like traps, uh, poisons, and various sort of DM toolkit items into one chapter. Lots more magical items, um, as well as redesigns and rethinks of, of some of the classic ones as well. That will take up the largest portion of the book, as is expected. It, uh, is treasure and magic items will take up the biggest portion of the book. And the only thing they've gone into some level of detail with in a separate video is Bastions, which is a stronghold building set of rules for the game, which is primarily player run, not GM run. And it kicks in at level five. You can start getting a Bastion at level five. Um, and then at subsequent levels, you can upgrade how many facilities your Bastion can have. Um, and there are 29 facilities, uh, including things like a laboratory, a meditation chamber, a sanctum, a guild hall, a storehouse, all the types of things you would expect uh, that can go into a bastion, depending on how you want to build it, whether you want to build it as a guild, whether you want to build it as a, a wizard's tower, whether you want to build it as a, a sort of tavern or a, a workshop, however you want to build it. There's options there to do that. And they, they do have in-game benefits as well to building those things. We haven't gone into too much detail on that. But, for example, the training room 
does have a mechanical benefit in game to having a training room in your bastion, which makes a lot of sense. Um, it also they have their own turn. Every seven in-game days, you take a bastion turn, which again is player run, and allows for the bastion to continue having things happen, but without getting in the way of your adventures. So you don't have to be at your bastion in order to continue building it and having your hirelings doing things, learning things, studying, all that sort of stuff. That, that, that will continue even while you're deep in the Tomb of Horrors, screaming for your life, uh, trying to solve <laughs> the right. puzzles. It's, de it's definitely a really good uh, mechanic for dungeon masters to have a to have as like the bare bones for building homesteads effectively really for their for their characters that make sense for the sort of adventuring characters that they are based on their classes and stuff so it, it's nice it's a nice touch because it's it's a way of kind of keeping players engaged in the game you know because outside a... of sessions as well if you want yeah. to do it like that right there's and... that specifically you can yeah. use the bastion turns outside of actual play and wow. sort of yeah. message each yeah. other about right. how the bastion's getting so on. yes i was talking to one of our one of our Roll Dark Marches players um, about this, and I think it will be yeah. probably something that we try and implement into the into yeah. the, mar into the Roll Dark Marches because it seems Absolutely. almost custom made for it at this point. Yeah, yeah. especially because we we run sessions based on every week a new set of sessions comes out, so we can have per week you having your actions, and that that seems to make the most sense to me. Yeah, totally. As we try and keep to real time. Yeah, change the model the schedule for next week. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But I, it does segue us nicely into Tales from the Table as I have <laughs> as I have a few from, <laughs> from our Roll Dark Marches players. Is that, is that the end of the news? That uh, is, yeah. I mean, keep your eyes on the YouTube channels for more information on the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, and I think still expected to launch in November, as far as I'm aware. Sweet. Mm -hmm. The Dungeon Master's Guide. So, yeah, look forward to that Not one. Far yeah. away at all. Yeah. So, yeah, Tales from the Tables. Ooh, James. Uh, Roll Up Marches. Well, how's it been going? Well, Roll Up Marches has been going wonderfully, Rob. Um, I must say, it's it's really kept me engaged as a, as a DM. I find myself out of out of sessions a lot of the time, creating adventure hooks and, and all sorts and building lore, <laughs> like background lore for the world. <laughs> Um, nice. So yeah, it's it's been really good. All the I must say, all the players have really sort of fully engaged with it. They've gone into a lot of detail with with their characters and sort of what they want from the town. So yeah. for people who for people who haven't played in it, I would highly recommend. Other than being great value for money, I think the world that we're all building together, the players and the DMs, is really cool. Um, and we're like slowly filling it out. Um, with a really nice level of rich detail, but I don't think that in doing so we've made it sort of incomprehensible to come in and start playing. It's all yeah. quite spread out. There's lots of different sort of plot threads that are, that are going on, but they're they're all moving relatively slowly, so people can still keep up with them um, right. and sort of do what they want to do. So we've got players who are starting shops. We've got players who have started a tavern, uh, guild houses. Um, so yes, yeah, especially like like Damien was saying, these new rules are going to be great at implementing bonuses and, and things for that, especially if they're kicking at level five because no one's reached level five yet. Um, and the way we're running XP um, now is that every session you play, you get 300 XP. So if you play one session, you imme you'll immediately get to level two. And then eventually as you as people go through levels even the ones who have been playing for a little bit longer the players below them will start catching up um <laughs> actually one of our, one of our players uh Jan, uh sent me a load of these like insane sort of like spreadsheet documents showing how xp build up would would work and how best to to run it so i've cool. taken taken that <laughs> fully fully under wing uh, and uh, and have used it because the maths checks out, and we do like a bit of uh, <laughs> over overly complicated maths. But yeah. it has meant that going forward, yeah, it should mean that no new players coming in should, if they if they continue to play regular sessions, will will quickly yeah. catch up and and end up at a similar level to, to other people without it taking forever. Um, so no, yeah, uh, 
I have so many tales from from there adventure wise but luckily we've got um a wiki uh, that everyone adds to so everyone can see every new sort of point that's discovered and it's great uh, chris has set, set it up on legend keeper the, the website and so every uh, there's a there's a big world map and uh, dms and players can add pins to it so uh after a session if my players have discovered some new things i'll go in i'll write descriptions for it add a pin on the map as to where that is and then i'll add um the battle maps that i've used uh, so people who even weren't in the session can see all the areas that they've been to and be like oh that's that's quite a cool area when we go through there and it also means the other dms have access to all the all the maps we're using so that's really cool um so we have had very recently I suppose I'll, what I'll do actually is maybe summarize some of the uh, the bigger plot points. So we have a xenomorph style worm infestation that the players have been slowly sort of investigating and, and coming around to, meaning that they've in, uh, interacted with a few different um, groups. So I will start with saying that there was uh, some. Uh, some dryads and some hobgoblins that the players uh, found the hobgoblins seem to be doing some sort of dark ritual under the mountain uh, and the players have taken uh, <laughs> taken umbrage with this as they should um, ended up with a huge huge battle under the mountain over a big pit uh, only to find out that as they killed the last hobgoblin these horrible worm like creatures were emerging from their throats and so they captured one to take it back to the town to study um, which is another cool thing that they can do in between in between sessions. They can do things like that. Um, right. So, um, yeah, there is a hag that um, keeps making a... Uh, we know how much you like hags, Rob. Uh, uh -huh. Keep making uh, appearances um, and trying to offer players, um, like, favours. Like, if I, if I give you information pertinent to whatever quest you're on, uh, you'll, you'll just owe me a favour. And so far, I will say the players have been very, very good at rejecting all the advances of, uh, of Granny Irene. Um, but there will come a time, I imagine, when the benefits will outweigh the maybe perceived threat of <laughs> of what will happen if they don't get the information from her they need. Um, and finally, I think recently, they have discovered there is a Kraken cult uh, made up of Kua Toa. Um, on an island off the shore and they have they have realized that they've actually been receiving far less supply drops from the from the mainland onto this new continent that they are setting up a town on exploring and this is the this is the reason for that it would appear that the krakens have been uh sinking ships although they've also found a huge kraken tentacle washed up ripped from a kraken's body on the very beach that the town is built on oh, so man. It'll be interesting to see where where that goes as well. Uh, there's also some yarn tea who are who are trying to fight these hobgoblins, um, although they are doing so in a way that the the town finds objectionable, as they were trying to sa uh, human sacrifice or centaur sacrifice a young centaur uh, child to to make uh, to, to fight back. So yeah, it's, uh, there's some really cool stuff going on and like emergent uh, gameplay and. Uh, seeing where players want to take their characters and also the world, um, and I know, and I know that um, this week, both me and Chris have, uh, have had to cancel our, our sessions. To me due to technical issues, and Chris due to uh, having no voice. He's very, very sick, which is uh, the same reason that JC's not made it today. It's that I think must be going around post school starts, and then their their sickness spreads yeah. from from parents outwards. <laughs> buggers, buggers. Uh, what would be really nice, uh, what you just said there about the ships being attacked and stuff, is that if we were to introduce new players into Roll Up Marches, so if there's anyone out there who's, who's a new player that wants to join in, they could be like one of the sailors that um, has managed to like swim ashore or something like that, you mm -hmm. know, one of the attacked ships or, or whatever. And it, do you know what I mean? Like they, they can know that there's a, there's a ship that's out, that's, that's a wreck that's got loads of cool shit on it and they've got to go get it. Mm -hmm. it like just, there's that... so, so much scope for like really cool ways to bring people in. Yeah, well, I, it, uh, and as you as you say that, the last uh, couple of players who've joined the Roll Dark Marches, that is how they were introduced. Their their ship arrived, damaged, and some of the crew had been taken, 
which is why the players when then went back out on the ship to investigate this uh, this island where they were seen to be taken. But previous to that, um, in my very second session, so like over a month ago, there was a ship that had, that had crashed and washed up on shore and they found the wreckage of it. And no one really knew why that had happened, but they went to rescue the try and find survivors from it. And that was a, a quest they did ages ago. Um, and some of the the survivors had then had been kidnapped by a completely different uh, faction. They kidnapped by the Hag, um, but that was set up in advance. And it's really cool that we can do this stuff because people are dropping in and out of games where you can have a bit of information. Uh, and there in the Discord is like a tavern chat for in character discussions outside of sessions that the players use to be able to like drop little tidbits of information and. Uh, and talk about their the sessions and what's happened and what they would like to do, uh, and so it's really cool when you see like people talking and being like, "Hey, that thing that happened a few sessions ago, I think we found another piece of that puzzle here," and uh, and it's, it's yeah, it's really cool to see. Excellent, awesome, cool. Uh, Damien, your uh, Fallout um, started its second. Uh, was it second or third? Uh, we were about. Um... We're about, I think, five sessions through now. We've had a few in, intermittent weeks where we've had to, to break for various uh, personal reasons for players, but we've been relatively consistent with it, um, and it's really picking up steam. And I have to, I have to say, I'm having a lot of fun running the system uh, and, and a system that's very different from D and D. It's, mm. I've said before, it's very closely geared to matching the playstyle of the video game, especially Fallout Four. Um, including including shopping, we just had a, a a good chunk of a shopping session last night, and <laughs> how the how the system handles shopping is a lot of fun. Basically, as in the video game, every character has a look stat, um, that number will be somewhere around seven through uh, twelve, something like that. And whenever you go to a, a shop to buy something, every item in the game has a rarity. And mm. so you go to the shop, you roll a number of D6s, special D6s from the game, equal to your look stat, and however many uh, sixes you roll, uh, which is a, a special face on the dice of a vault boy, um, that's how that's the number of rarity of items that are available at that shop. And you roll that every oh, time. Wow. So it has this sort of automatic dice-based economy where depending on how lucky you are depends on how likely you are to find a more rare item, whether that's, that's food nice. or a weapon or something like that. Hmm. Um, that's a really good concept. You could easily transfer that into D and D. Could you? Could and it, it, it takes a lot of pressure off as a GM because um, mm. you know shopping sessions for D and D can always be a bit fraught when you're trying to work out. Okay, is this going to be available? How much is it going to cost? Is this going to be too powerful? You know, when a player asks for something yeah. specific, you have to then very quickly research it if you don't know it by heart. And um, it can be a little tricky to determine just how much is available, especially in the case of magic items yeah, um, totally. and potions and things. So having you'd have to attribute a rarity to every item, which could be a bit of work. Um, but if you did it, it would be a really elegant way of saying, okay, so this is the maximum level of rarity you're going to have I mean, I suppose the items do have a rarity level already. You just have to attribute a number to it on a, on yeah. a D6 or a, another dice. So it could be done. And it, it, mm. it just takes away a lot of the pressure of, you know, players saying, oh, is there a, you know, is there a mini nuke available? Well, no, because that's a really high rarity and it's unlikely you're going to be able to find that um, at a shop with such a low luck score. A mini <laughs> nuke. Um, <laughs> they exist. And that's, that's the other thing that I have to say about this game is... In any other game, mm. you know, things like morality <laughs> and, and bonkers situations can sometimes feel a bit out of place. But in Fallout, I never feel, no matter how outlandish or morally grey the plan that the players come up with, it never, I never feel as a GM that I'm like, oh, that's maybe going to take away from the sort of vibe I'm going for in this game. That's never the case. The more bonkers the situation, that last night they just, they were making a navigation check to get to their next place that they're going to go and try and rescue from the clutches of nuclear winter. And they successfully rolled it without complication, without encounter. But then one of them said, oh, can we can we include a bit of scavenging along the way? 
And I said, well, yeah, you absolutely can. You're going to need to spend some resource to do it. But I'm also going to maintain the level of risk that the travel had. So by stopping and scavenging, you are adding a little of it bit of extra risk when you've already technically succeeded yeah okay that's great yeah we'll do that and they of course rolled a complication and are now being attacked at a motel slash truck stop by a bunch of super mutants <laughs> um, <laughs> oh dear and again oh, that Love feeling it. of the video game where you go to a place you think oh i'll just have a bit of a look around here and then that random encounter happens where there's a group of super mutants walking down the road they spot you instantly and you either run for your life or try and fight. And sadly, I mean, they did stand and fight, set up an ambush for the super mutants. And mm. I don't think they rolled a single success across an entire round of combat. <laughs> wow. They had a terrible set of rolls. So we're going to see where that goes next week in terms of um, how they get out of that fight. And then they've got a lot of really fun uh, sort of locations and combat encounters coming up based on the next few quests that they've got in front of them. So a really fun Very system. I know I know D&D is the sort of is everybody's wish list to play D&D, but I've said it I've said it before. I feel like I preach it a lot, but do try out some other systems if you've if you've got access to them and you've got players that are willing to to dive in with you. Give it a go because you can like you've just said Rob, you can learn a lot about how to make D&D more interesting or easier on you just by playing other systems that have different ways of approaching how you do something, whether that's a dice roll or whether that's a, a moral quandary or whether it's how you do shopping, you can learn a lot and, and it, apply that to your D&D game. Um, yeah, totally. So, yeah, highly recommend. Try some systems. Try them out. When I yes. played Star Trek Adventures over lockdown, there was loads from that that I took into into my D&D games like how like a, a band of people can work together based on their strengths in order to achieve one outcome and it's yeah, like okay yeah. you need to do this you need to do that you, you roll for this you roll for that and it all kind of like builds upon each role and then you work that like work out an average based on what it what they all rolled together to determine the outcome and it was like a really and it's a really nice way of kind of enforcing the teamwork as, aspect of something rather than just like you know the success is is dependent on one person's role. You yeah, know, it's with really, advantage really nice. of someone's helping. Which yeah, is yeah, dead simple, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. I really like Star Trek Adventures. It's a shame we can. It's the same system out. effectively as Fallout, yeah, and um, with some changes. And it's a great system. I'm 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 just about to pick up the second edition core book because they've just done a second edition yeah, of Star Trek. Nice. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, I will bring that back at some point because yeah. it's a great system. Yeah, I really, I really want to play it. It's, I think, I think it could more. Uh, well, I don't know. I do kind of feel like it might lend itself more to face to face in person rather than online, perhaps. Possibly. Mm. Mm, I don't know why that is though, but it's, it, it just, yeah. I don't know. It's mm. tricky. It's a tricky. One I, to figure out. Yeah, talking of new game <laughs> mechanics, I, I'm intrigued by the Discworld. RPG that's um, yes. that's coming out from Modiphius because they've mentioned that there is some sort of pun wordplay mechanic to the to the game. We actually uh, talked which is... about it last week. Yeah, they've. Oh, it I'm so sorry. <laughs> James um... is asleep. <laughs> oh, you so are here. You are here. You are here. You are I wasn't here. Really, so... really briefly, how it works is um, rather than having numerical stats, characters instead have a series of traits, and whenever mm. a situation occurs in the game where success or failure is relevant instead of um just using a stat and rolling a dice you decide which of your traits is most relevant to the situation and then effectively pitch that to the gm as why that is a useful trait to have in this particular situation and then the okay. gm based on your your pitch <laughs> of your mm -hmm. trait will give you a dice which will either be a d4 for a really mm -hmm. rubbish justification or a, yeah. something like a d12 for a really great justification. And then the okay. GM rolls, I think it's a d8. And as long right. as your number comes out higher than what the GM rolls, you succeed. So, okay. That's yeah. very cool. A really interesting narrative-based die system. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so there's still some element of, of luck in there, but yeah. Because yeah. I, 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 a long time ago on the podcast, I, I think maybe one of our very first episodes, I said that I would like to try and create a... Um, persuasion mechanic or intimidation mechanic where there's certain key words in an encounter that you have to try and hit 
in your persuasion of him and those keywords you you could find out by maybe studying something about the character or finding out information about them so if you knew a bit of their background you could then use that to leverage as long as you use the right phrase or, or keywords or things like that to succeed or fail an encounter yeah you could extrapolate that i suppose you could have um a bonus dice to the roll based on how well they hit that, mm. that task so again applying like a d4 or a yeah. you know much higher if they really hit all the right beats to to give them that extra leverage in a in a, an encounter yeah that's pretty yeah. cool so I'll probably trademark this now i've said it out loud on a podcast or something look at it before it's before it's nicked yeah why the hell not cool all right guys well thank you so much for this episode uh thank you for tuning in as well of course everyone at home who's listening uh, and we will see you guys next uh, week. Well, you'll, you won't see us. Will you? You'll hear us. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really confused. Anyway, yeah. Um, cool. Nice one. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Take care. See you later. Bye. Bye.